Hello everybody, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. These Q&As are held from questions from people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. And the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is a 12 part 15 hour video series where I filmed everything that I did to train my own deer dog over about an 18 month period. We filmed everything I did training it right from an 8 week old pup right through to a fully trained deer dog shooting deer over it out in the field. You can find out more about that at biggameindicatingdogs.com and you can also see lots of videos, posts and photos at Big Game Indicating Dogs on YouTube and also Facebook and Instagram. Again, both under Big Game Indicating Dogs. You can follow my own personal stuff at Paul John Michaels at Instagram, Facebook and YouTube as well. Let's get into the Q&A. First question is from Ben. Hey mate, I'm on part two of the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. The pup is walking good out in front but not very responsive on the sit and stay, gets very distracted. What can I do to get a more responsive cheers? My note on this is super common. The pup probably just needs more time and work. On part two, your pup should be roughly 12 weeks old. You know, and this can vary hugely. We've talked about this quite a bit in Q&As and all over the place. But, you know, uh, and it's really about reading the pup or dog. And, you know, if the pup or dog's learning quickly and getting bored, you want to move on. Um, but if the pup or dog's not getting it either, then then take your time and stay on what you're working on until the pup gets it. And you could end up you could end up four weeks out, you know. You, um, you might get ahead on some stuff, but be behind on some other stuff as well. You know, so it's always important to watch well ahead in the blueprint. Um, the ideal scenario, it might sound a little bit extreme given that the series is 15 hours, then again it probably doesn't considering the amount of, you know, Netflix series and things that people watch. Uh, if you can watch the whole freaking blueprint all the way through, then you know where you're going, you know the whole thing, you've, you've even watched the hunting and what we're going to be doing right at the end, so... When you, when you come right back to part one again and you're working with your pup, um, you know why you're doing the things now. You know why you're doing them. You know how they need to be set up. You also know what you're going to be doing next as well. So if you're not getting something perfect right now, you, you might not stress about it as much if you knew what you were going to be working on in six weeks' time or in the next part or two or three parts time. You know, the, for the stop drill, for example, is something that we work on basically for the entire blueprint, even in the later parts of it, of training. The first 10 parts of training, the last two parts of hunting. Um, even in part eight and nine, we're still working on uh, extending the stop. Uh, stop to the shot, increasing distraction on the stop, uh, automatic stop, hand signals, so it's basically a silent stop, um, loads of stuff, you know. So again, a bit of a side rant here, but I'm sort of trying to tie it all back into this question. But um, if you're on part two, the pup's walking out, out in front good, but not very responsive on the sit and stay, gets distracted, what I can can I do to get him more responsive? Um, and... and this has been a relatively common question and I've gone over it loads of times in Q&As as well. We do, on, on biggameindicatingdogs.com, on, on the earlier Q&As, they're all logged up onto there and with all the questions written in the notes um, and even the time codes to the YouTube video so you can actually go in there and, and, and use the search bar up the top of the website and search for certain words or terms like working on like stop drill puppy and it'll bring that up or barking in the kennel or so on and so forth um, and it'll bring up all of the Q&As and the time code straight to them but only sort of the first half of the 20 or 30 odd Q&As that we've done are set up like that 
um, because it's a hell of a lot of work. And we we haven't been doing it with the last few. Um, But I've spoken about this heaps, about what I'm about to speak talk about now is that you know in the blueprint we start the stop work freaking early some pups learn it faster than others some pups it takes a long time some systems they don't even work on the stop and certain things until later on because a lot of pups are slow to pick it up but what we do in the blueprint you have to be out there with your pup anyway you have to be doing stuff with it anyway so what we do is, is particularly early on, we're not putting any crazy pressure on it. We're not using treats. We're not using e collars. We're not. We're just going through the motions, giving that command, stepping in, push it gently, pushing the pup's bum down. It gets a pat when it does it right, and then we move on. And there really can be a point in that part. And part two is right where you're at. That even part three. Um, Print went through this whole thing where it, it, he took a long time to get the stop drill dialed in and it really is just a matter of keeping super calm about it not freaking out that the pup's not getting it instantly and I don't want to say go through them just go through the motions you know because just going through the motions is is kind of uh, associated with only half assing it or not doing it properly but well, I guess the the correct way to do it is just stick to the system and just repeat, repeat, repeat. Don't get pissed off. Don't put unnecessary pressure on the pup or dog. It's learning. Again, we, do, we, we start this stuff super early. Um, so it's just a matter of just keep working with it. Take every chance you can to keep it positive. And, and even when you're getting those two or three, the beginning of those, that two or three seconds of sit, um, praise the pup, keep it light, try to release it while it's still doing it right. Don't try to push you if you if your pup's just starting to get it and it's just starting to sit or you do have to step in and put gently push the pup's bum down and then you give it a pat and you step back and it stays for three or four seconds. But in previous sessions, it's you've, you've been doing that you, sit, you, you say sit, sit, you stand on the long line half a second later, which stops the pup just after it hears the sit command. Except all it does is just stop and just stands there, doesn't know what's going on. You step in, you gently push the pup's bum down, give it a little pat as soon as its bum hits the ground and step back. And, and you're at that point where when you step back, the pup is getting up off the stop. If you keep working on it and you get that two or three second sit, don't start trying to push your luck. Release the pup while it's still sitting. You know, and then you, you go from at the very extreme beginning end of it trying to get two or three seconds and then you just slowly extend that from two or three seconds to six or eight to 10 to 12 to 30 seconds and then you start circling and doing your walking around and all the movement and stuff that you'll see if you watch forward if you watch ahead um but i mean short answer to this is um my pup's walking good out front but isn't responsive on the sit this is in part two so again you're still working with about a 12 week old pup gets isn't responsive on the sit and gets distracted that's sort of where they are at generally at that point and it's just a matter of just repeating and repeating and and doing you know i mean i could ramble on as um for as long as i want here but it's all there in the blueprint and all the the talk and talking and set up and then the demonstration and then breaking down what you've just seen and all of that but it's really just watching all of that Getting, having a really good understanding of it and, and it's really important to do all that stuff properly eh? you know um, how it's done the timing of everything um, if you get one little thing wrong you can be screwing the pup up and that can make it distracted and not responsive so you've got to be really careful that you're not doing anything like that um, 
but then it's just then it's just a matter of repeating it and sticking with it and, and being patient and keeping it calm and positive. Um, yeah. Uh, Alex. Alex has got two questions. Um, Papa's coming to the end of part two. For some reason, the Papa started barking in the car, either going or coming from work or going and coming from a training session. I give the command a disapproval, which works sometimes. Anything else that I can do? My note on this is crate the pup. This is another one that I've talked about uh, more than once in Q&As and done big talks about it, but... Um, Pups and dogs that are free in a big area when driving, if they're free in the back seat or free in a big canopy of a of a of a ute, or the worst for it is probably tied to the back of a ute. You, every now and again, you um, you'll be out in the country somewhere and you hear this barking coming closer and closer, and it's whoa 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 whoa, and it's a car, it's a it's a farmer's truck dry, ute driving by with the old hunt away on the back, just constant bark all <laughs> while he's driving, um, which just drive, that would drive me completely nuts. But um, a pup or a dog that has all that free space and can and can look around and look out the window um, or off the back of the truck, they're far more likely to bark. And one of the easiest ways to get on top of barking quickly, barking in the in the car or truck is to put the dog in a crate or put it in the in a dog box and all of a sudden it's in a smaller space, it can't see as much and they'll quieten down. Um, there's lots I could go on and on and on about that but that's the first thing I would do. If the pup's on the back seat, you say uh, for some reason the pup started barking in the car Get, I don't know where it is in the car. That a little bit more detail there would have been good, but if it is in the back seat or if it's in in a canopy in a truck or it's tied to the back of the truck, the first thing I would do is get it in a crate or a dog box, give it less space. Don't so it's and then it can't look around as much, and it usually works very very well. And we've had people with this exact problem of of. Uh, suggested that they do that and they've gone away and done it and it's worked very well and I've done it loads of times in the past and it's just a well-known thing amongst people that know about dogs and farmers and hunters and things is um, put that bloody dog in a dog box and it'll shut up. <laughs> um, and again, you know, it's it's not about um, necessarily about uh, having to have that pup in a dog box in every vehicle for the rest of its life but it's a, it is a really good way to eliminate the issue and nip the habit in the bud and get on top of it and hopefully get that pup or dog to the point where it doesn't bark um, in the truck or in the car, you know. And um, uh, it's one of those things, do, sort of do the worst first, get on top of it, get, that, get everything sorted, surrounding your pup or dog traveling in vehicles without the barking and once you get it right uh then it should be able to be in the back seat or wherever and it's not barking that's what the situation i had with my dogs i've spoken about the situation that i had with my dogs at one point where they started to but I, I got in that real routine of driving them just around the corner to the park to go for their runs and um, I created too much of a pattern. Um, it's one of our principles we talk about a lot in the blueprint about breaking up patterns. It's a big part of a proper stop drill. Um, I created too much of a pattern. There was too much anticipation with the dogs and they started barking and whining as I drove around to the park. So what I had to do was start to drive past the park and and uh, put get in the habit of putting my dogs in the truck just when I went for a drive any, anyway. Um, and I broke it up. I won't go into it all again, but um, if that's happening, the you know, you're getting that issue with the pup or dog barking, 
get it in the crate, get it in a dog box, eliminate the issue, get the dog used to travelling in the vehicle without barking, and then it can come back out of the crate or the box once it's sorted. Uh, next question for Alex is, in a stop command, which, which is going pretty well most of the time, sometimes after a stop the pup will start going into a pup zoom. So zoom, zoomies, people call them or whatever, um, you know, is when the dog just starts running around like an idiot, um, jumping up, blasting around. And if you're in a training, if you're training for the blueprint, you're trying to do uh, walk nice and slow and close right in front, and everything calm and controlled. This is another common question that I've answered a lot in Q and A's. Um, and every now and again, the dog just gets sick of training. Um, usually too much pressure, I'll go into this soon, and they just get completely sick of it, and they start being an idiot, running around, being all, they know that you want them to be calm and controlled, and they'll start running around like idiots. In extreme cases, they'll start jumping up on you and trying to nip at you, and um, it can get pretty full on. But so Alex has said in a stop command, which is going pretty well most times, sometimes after the stop, Sometimes after a stop, the pup will start going into a pup zoom. I give a stern command of disapproval and step on the long line, but this can keep happening another two or three times. Anything else I can do, I feel like my go command is pretty calm and chill with the step off. Um, my notes here is less pressure during training, less drills, more relaxed walking and praise. Often that that zoomy stuff not always and quite often it's a trait thing um you don't say pup is coming up to the end of part two um so you're talking a four month old pup it's freaking young man real real young um yeah if, if that's if, if it's in the car I definitely have it in the crate, regardless. You know, I just wouldn't. It's just something. That's just something I wouldn't do with such a young pup. Is just have them running around the back seat. Um, straight away, I'm I'm thinking here. You're driving to training, and the pups on the back seat barking, and then it's doing zoomies during training. Um, That to me is just build, build, is building a picture in my head. I've got this vision of a pup barking on the way to training, and you're saying, you know, you were giving command of disapproval, but um, which works sometimes, meaning it doesn't work all the time. So now I'm imagining a pup barking on the back seat. You're telling it to stop, and it keeps barking, and then you get to the park, and now you're trying to train. That is just a freaking disaster zone. You know, we talk about the importance of kenneling before and after training, creating that real nice contrast so the pup is nice and calm and quiet with nothing going on right before you train. So when you get to it and let it out of its kennel and put a long line on it and start doing drills with it, training is interesting, contrasted from that it's quiet in the kennel, nothing's happening. Now all of a sudden... You're in a training area, and yeah, you're, you're doing stop drills, you're telling it to sit, but you're also stepping in, engaging with it, patting it, re giving it the release, walking around. So training is a positive, high-priority activity. If you take a pup from, uh, you know, running around with kids or running around the back lawn, or, or a pup just has too much of a chill lifestyle, Lots and lots of freedom. And it's running around at home and then barking in the truck on the way, barking in the car on the way to training. And then you tell that pup to sit. It's just like, nah, man, this, is, this isn't what we do. This isn't what I'm like. <laughs> Everything you do with a pup is molding what that pup, pup or dog is, you know, and, and, it, particularly everything it does in your presence. So if it's barking in the back seat 
and you're trying to tell it not to and it's not listening, that's a terrible scenario, man. Terrible. Hence why crater kindling and crating is so freaking important and why with a young pup, I just wouldn't even go there where it's free in a vehicle, really. Um, yeah. But usually, so it could be that. It's hard to say, but you're talking about zoomies. It's probably, it's most likely either too much lack of structure outside of training, so the pup's just getting into training and it's just like, well, you know what I mean? You, you can't have no structure outside of training and a pup or dog doing all sorts of crazy shit and then expect it to be awesome in training. It's, it's not going to just switch like that. Um... Every moment counts. That's what that's a hundred percent one of our principles. Every moment counts. That, and that's another really good reason to watch the whole blueprint too, because the principles are broken, are, are spread out throughout the whole series. And I go into them in depth as they come up markedly in training. As they really come up, as I'm really dealing with it, as I'm like, okay, see what's happening here. This is exactly why I'm doing this because of this principle. That's when I go right into them and have a big talk about them. And one of those principles is every moment counts. And the rule of transfer is another principle. So every moment counts is exactly that. If if something crazy happens, you um, you know, you put your pup or dog in the wrong situation before it's ready without a lead or long line on and it takes off and does chases something chases another dog goes tearing off across the park or um, it's barking in the back seat and you're trying to tell it to stop and it's not really listening but you, and, and you've never really cut that whole situation off at the past you've just sort of let it slide um, if the pup has too much freedom around home every moment counts man and another one of our principles one moment can last forever one moment can last forever, where you can have it. You can be doing everything right with a dog, with a pup or dog, and one big stuff up, and you'll see the result of that pop up forever. I've had that with hunt with dogs, with hunting dogs. You know, you fire a shot with a gun too soon before you finish your introduction to gunfire, that will haunt you forever. Yet you can do work and fix it, but you not. That's why it's one moment can count forever. It's not every moment definitely counts forever. It's one moment can count forever because you don't know, and that's why it's so important to do everything properly. It's quite unpredictable, and you can't. You know, look at my challenges that I've had with Miko um, after the Kiwi aversion training, and then. And then after um, I didn't do introduction to gunfire perfectly and then she got a shock while trying to retrieve one of her very first shot birds in the field while hunting. Frickin' nightmare. And I put tons and tons of work into it, make a whole heap of progress, and then somewhere else later on in the field, the perfect combination of factors, a fence, a drain that was kind of like that last, the last time she got a shock, I've just, the shot that I fired was, she was kind of in front of me, so she, it, the shot was a bit louder, and the bird flaps a bit like the other one, one that she got a shock off one time, and cause she got two shocks off two birds, and um, all of a sudden she'll clam up and she'll deny a retrieve. You know, so, so, uh, every moment counts, one moment can count forever, and the rule of transfer is, is what's happening in one situation can transfer to another. So a pup or dog barking in the back seat can transfer into the stop drill where it'll be a, an idiot in the back seat. Uh, in the, so excuse me, it'll be an idiot in the stop drill because it, it was just being an idiot in the back seat. 
it's transferred across the rule of transfer. And the rule of transfer, and actually every moment counts, um, and one moment can count forever too, they both work both ways. So if you get, if you handle one situation really freaking well, then that transfers over to another situation too, and your and your dog's way more likely to handle that situation well too. If while hunting or try, say let's use an example of hunting. This is also the principle of training with success. If you have done all your training just right, and and your dog's leap come sneaking in on the wind, and it locks up on that deer properly. It sees the deer as it comes over the brow of the hill. It locks up. You shoot it. The dog st- sits down to the shot. The deer goes running and falls over. And you go over to it. That's the pup or dog has just done all of that perfectly. That's going to transfer over too. To the next hunting situation. And that's going to be a moment that will count forever. If you don't do it properly and the dog breaks, chases a deer... That's going to transfer over. That's going to be the moment that's going to count forever. So, like usual, I've launched in super ranty. (laughs) Um, But this is is it. This is good dog training, you know. This is um, what these Q&As are all about. So, okay, so it could be that. It could be that you're being too chill, too much silly stuff is happening outside of training and that's transferring into training. Um, it could be the opposite. It could be the opposite or actually worse, a combination of the two. It could be another, sometimes zoomies and jumping up and biting and rebelling is just too much pressure. Too much pressure, repeating drills over and over and over too much and not doing enough just relaxed walking, you know, like a good training session early on when you just work, let's say early on when you're pretty much just working on range, the beginnings of the stop, drill, and turns are a pretty rough but good rule would be five or six stop drills in 15 or 20 minutes and five or six turns, and that would be a quite a bit, really. If you bump that up to 10 stop drills in 11 minutes and six turns, it's too, it can, it's too much. If you, if you know, if you, if you do a stop drill, go through the whole process and then give your go command, might be the double peep, and the dog, and the dog just wants to walk, it, it's, it's, it smelt something cool at the other end of the field the day before, and it's trying to get down there. And then twenty seconds later, you're and, and if your tone's a bit too harsh, too much pressure, you're like Max, sit. And then he sits, and you step in. Good boy, step back. Ah, you know, bit of movement. And you go again, and then twenty seconds later, Max, sit. Tell him to go. Sit, go, turn, stop, go. And repeating it over and over and over, even when the dog's doing it right. Uh, that can, but you're basically driving the dog around the bend and they'll rebel too. Hey, Print, print, print has heard the, <laughs> the double peep and uh, got up from his bed in the lounge and come walking in. Um, and so stuff like that can be from too much silly stuff outside of training transferring into training it can be from too much uh, structure or too, excuse me too much pressure too many drills not enough just relaxed walking a really important part of training and a really important thing that we're trying to foster and enhance in, our, in, a, in a particularly a big game indicating dog is just walking, calm, 
and close and happily and just their eyes are forward and we're just walking. You know, and and, and do, pup, pups and dogs love that too, getting out into a cool area and walking. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a really good sort of therapeutic thing. And and breaking up those drills with a good distance of walking, break it up with time and space. So let time pass and move a decent distance and then do another stop drill. You know, so um, it can be that silly stuff creeping in or it could be you trying to be too full on in training. The worst is and it's relatively common, is loads of silly stuff happening outside of training. So you've got heaps of silly stuff transferring in and and you're trying to be too over top in training. So you're basically setting the dog up to fail, bringing issues in, and then you're being too hard on it for having those issues. So you're just creating tons of conflict. Uh, and, and that zoomies and stuff, uh, a pup or dog that really freaking respects you and looks up to you does not do that shit. Um, they don't. And um, at least not without you initiating it. Print or play. The print doesn't even like me sit, catching him playing. Fly was exactly the same. Fly was exactly the same. Um, if Fly was playing with other dogs outside and and I walked out, she'd just stop and just be like looking at me, just like pretending that she wasn't just doing it. Um, Prince the same. Uh, Miko's semi, but not so much. A lot of that's just the nature of the dog. A lot of it's the training and the relationship and respect. Um. Print will play with me if I initiate it. If I I can see when they're getting to the point, they quite often Print and Miko quite often have a bit of a zoomy and play outside in the evenings. Like they just get to that time, like when it's cooling down and they know it, and it's and it's almost dark and they know they're a bit, you know, they're about to get brought inside and be locked inside for the day. And in the summer, particularly. They'll do it as the day cools down, you know, when it's real freaking hot in the summer, they're all just plaffed out, laying around all day. And as it cools off, they'll often have a bit of a, they'll just play, play outside and they'll be growling and barking and chasing each other around and stuff. You know, they'll do it for five or ten minutes. Um, if I see they're sort of in that mood or they've been sitting around for a few hours and I get up and walk around, they're all stretching and, um, you know, they, and they do the yawn and they're sort of flapping their ears and looking at you like, hey, what's going to get, what's what's going on? We're about to do something. Um, and I can actually jump around and sort of, um, you know, reach at print and sort of give them a little shove and um, like sl slap my knees and jump around exactly like a dog trying to initiate play. And he'll do it. Um, he'll start jumping around and Miko will come over and we, we have a little play around like that. Um, but. Man, particularly, but if I said, ah, he, he'd just stop, you know. Uh, a pup or dog that starts that shit doesn't respect you, man. It's every, you, your relationship screwed up. Um, it really is. And, but having said all this, too, you're at the end of part two with a three-month-old pup. Uh, end of part two, two, uh, two months, three months. So it could be four months old. It's still so freaking young. Um, it really is. And things like the crate thing, the barking in the car thing, you know, yeah... <sighs> It should be in a crate or dog box just to eliminate the issue. And the zoomy thing during training. Uh, 
uh, I give a stern command of disapproval and step on the long line, but this can keep happening another three or four times. Anything else I can do? Uh, I don't know what's going on here, man. It, it's You're either doing a little bit of stuff wrong or you're expecting too much, but your pup's freaking young still. And, and you've got to do everything right, you know, and have some patience. Um, I'm just sculling uh, sparkling water. She's all go. Um, <clears throat> Scott, hey, any tips on stopping burying food? Have a kennel and chain set up. Just starting bury, started burying her food. Meaty bones, dog roll, three months old collie. Thanks. Um, dogs bury their food when they know they can't eat it. So I would say you're feeding your pup or dog too much. I'd almost guarantee it. Yeah, I'd, pro I'd pretty, I'd probably pretty much leave that there. Um, it, it's also having a a dog, particularly a young pup, chained up on ground that it can dig holes in, is almost guaranteeing that that pup's going to dig holes. Um, I appreciate that you may not be able to afford a kennel and run. I appreciate that you may not have an area, a concreted area to put that that kennel on if the pup's chained to a kennel. It would be great if you get that, that kennel on concrete and then, then your dog can't dig. Um, but yeah, that's my two observations straight away off that. Dogs generally, dogs do only be with their food when they when they don't want to eat it at the time, so they're getting too much. Um, and a, a three month old pup chained up on dirt is gonna dig whether it's got food or not. Pretty much guaranteed. <laughs> guaranteed. Not that it's a shoe. I mean, it's teaching the pup to dig. You put a pup in a situation where it's going to dig. You're teaching, you're training that pup to dig, and that could quite off, quite easily go through to transfer through to adult life. Um, but that's my answer on that question anyway. Uh, long question here. I made these notes a couple of weeks ago, so I can't actually remember what this is. I'll just read it out. Uh, Luke, hi Paul. How do I slow or calm the dog down when making that final approach up close to a deer in the bush? Gypsy is nearly two years old, GSP hunt a GSP heading dog, super high energy, and completed the blueprint. She has a really good stop, go, and turn command. Her range is really good, and she is very attentive. She has a good recall and a good heel. She was very good with scent training, but haven't done that in a long time. I have shot one deer with her. While out hunting, she is very good at finding deer, but as we get right in close, she starts to get too amped up, frantically going backwards and forwards, side to side, and almost breaks into a run trying to get to the deer. And the more pressure I put on her, the more on edge she gets. This only happens when we are right in close and the deer is right in front of us, but we can't see it. She has seen a few deer and always locks up into a good point when she sees them. I'm still hunting her on the long line because of this and I end up trying to turn her away or check her with the long line which ends up with her whinging and yelping out of frustration at me turning her away. We have spooked so many deer now because of this and me growling her to try to slow her down. She tried to chase rabbits a couple of times during her training but just hit the end of the long line. <laughs> and she has chased a cat out of the yard a couple of times. If I can just get her to sneak in quietly on deer, she'll be a real weapon. Cheers. There's a lot going on there. I my note, 
Something is wrong, that's super uncommon, the cat thing stands out. <laughs> uh, and that's about what I was thinking. The rabbit and cat thing stands out. It's interesting that you've mentioned that as, as it's like you know that that was an issue, with whatever has happened. Um, I mean, we, I've talked about this a lot, that... Uh, an up and coming big game indicating dog chasing stuff anything rabbits, cats all of that sort of stuff is a massive issue massive massive because it's teaching them to chase stuff and then when they get close to deer they want to chase it that's what happens um, a dog, a puppy dog that chases stuff a lot. Um, when you start hunting deer with them, that's what they want to do. They've chased stuff before. You start getting, and it's just it's you've taught that dog that that is an option, and now that is in its head as you're sneaking up to deer, and it's thinking about it and it's wanting to go. You know, for print, it's ba it's just print. It's not even part of his vocabulary. And for a dog that has been trying, you know, talking about earlier, how doing everything perfect, every moment counts. One moment can last forever in the rule of transfer. And and that scenario of having that dog that you've raised and trained and managed perfectly, and it carries out that first hunt perfectly then that's all that is in its mental vocabulary. That it, it doesn't know anything else. <laughs> you know, it do, literally does not know how to do anything else. It doesn't ha have it in its head that it's like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. It only knows how to do it one way. That's how you do it. That's how you train a dog properly. It literally doesn't know anything else. And that's how the whole blueprint system is designed. Um, and and that's why that's where that principle comes up in the in the blueprint. I can't remember exactly what the circumstance was where that print that particular principle comes up in the blueprint, but that's why it is a principle. And and I had the big principle rant about it in the blueprint because and the rule of transfer. Every moment counts. One moment can count forever. That cat thing is a classic, classic example of that. You know, and that's why we do all of our training with a long line on. You know, if we go back to, to um, me growing up, around dogs and, and uh, hunting over dogs as a kid and um, basically them all being a complete stuff up and then and then as I started to um, really want to train dogs properly and I started studying dog training and I, and I trained a couple of okay dogs and then I went through this process of getting dogs and working with them and, and tra training them in different ways and hunting over them and all of that sort of stuff. I saw that. I literally did that with dogs where they were coming along good. Everything was going okay. I'd done a pretty good job and I had one stuff up. Like I took the dog off a lot. Like I shot a couple of deer over a dog. I hadn't done, I hadn't done anything like the blueprint. That's why the blueprint is the way it is. That's why good dog training systems are like the blueprint where you start right from a putt with a certain outcome in mind and everything you do with that pup or dog leading up to the point where you get to that outcome is done with that outcome in mind. You know, that whole dog's, everything you do with it is all about that outcome because it's so easy to screw it up and get it wrong. Um, but with a dog, and and it's and I was just starting to work it. I'm going back. Uh, 
you know, 10 years type of thing. Um, and I hadn't done enough training with the dog, but I was just, this is when I was just starting to work it out and starting to use long lines and different things. I was still experimenting with things like e collars and treat training and um, place boards and stuff like that. A lot of stuff that I don't use any of that stuff anymore. Um, but I was starting to train, you know, it, it, as a kid, um, we didn't even train. I didn't even know, but like my dad didn't train dogs. You just got a dog and took it hunting and it either made it or it didn't, you know. Um, as I started to train, I still hadn't, I still hadn't wrapped my head around like that proper training is again, what I just said, starting from a pup and training for like a year until the dog's ready to go, you know, and a year's fast. I've said this before too. Some people about the blueprint, you train that much? You, know, I've had people say, people, <laughs> I've literally had people ask me, like seriously ask me, did you really not take print hunting until he was 15 months old? Did you honestly train for 10 months? Yes. <laughs> like the, the idea is so outlandish to them that they question the fact that that's how I did it. Like, <laughs> uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, but that's just an example of how far away some people's mindset is compared to where real dog trainers are, are at. You know, if you look at um, a really high-end working dog or a high-end, a really high-end bird dog, and, and I, see, I worked this out when I started studying really high-end dog training and, and traditional dog training, traditional English bird dog training, and I started reading about uh, people training a dog for three years before they even started hunting it. Three years of training before you even start hunting it. Three years. <laughs> you know, I feel like I should say that like three or four times in a row or something. But, uh, and I started going back, doubling back. So I'm starting to work out dog training. I'm experimenting with different stuff. I've done some training with the dog. I start to see it look pretty good in training. So I'm like, man, let's go hunting with this dog. It actually goes starts to go pretty good in the bush, and I'm shooting deer over it, and it's good, mainly because it's got no confidence yet. <laughs> so so the small amount of the inadequate amount of training that I've done, mainly the inadequate amount of of steadiness work that I've done. I'm getting away with that because the dog hasn't got enough confidence yet to start breaking and chasing deer. It's still in that mode where it's like, it's keen and it's taking me in and it's hunting well, but it's still like, holy shit, I'm working all of this stuff out. And then I've got cocky or basically I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not still naive and ignorant. I don't know yet. And I, I put the dog in a silly situation one day. It's off the long line. And a rabbit gets up in front of it and it tears off and chases the rabbit. And that coincides with, I've shot three deer over that dog now, so now it's gaining confidence. And the next deer that it sees in the bush, it chases it like that rabbit. Mistakes all coincide and, and cross over and combine right at the at the perfect, or in this case, the the, the worst time ever, and bang, now I've got a massive problem. Now I've got a dog that's chased a deer. And it chased it for a long way, and it enjoyed it too. And now it's in its head, and now it wants to do it again. You know, so um, that's, a, that's a classic example of that. And, and a, a dog that's tried to chase a rabbit on the long line a couple of times during training but just hit the end of the long line... Did that happen after it chased the cats? How many times is a couple of times? A couple's usually two, but then some people, <laughs> you're like, I happened a couple of times. I so like twice, nah, probably 
four or five. And how was it in that situation where it chased the cats out of the yard? Um, so, I mean, none of this stuff is accusational. I'm not saying this is what's happened or what you've done. I'm just throwing everything I can out, out there based on what I'm seeing in these questions. Um, another massive thing that stands out to me with this question is that uh, I'm pretty sure you said you've only shot one deer over the dog. You've shot one deer over the dog and it's chased stuff more than once. You know, so... And also, I've said something is wrong. This is super uncommon. Uh, I've mucked around with a lot of dogs, and I've, I've 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 trained and worked with and shot deer over a lot of dogs, and I've done that with a lot of dogs that have come to me with a lot of serious issues. I'm talking dogs that have chased lots of deer, dogs that have been sent out after multiple wounded deer. Dogs that have auto-retrieved birds like mad and chased lots of deer and like chased them, chased wounded deer and, to, and they're like d grabbing them around the throat and, and, and the owner's turning up and killing the deer and patting the dog, stuff like that, you know. Um, and I've worked with those dogs until I can take them hunting and shoot deer over them and they're better than what you're saying with, is happening with your dog. So something's wrong here. Something's out of place. Something's, um, something doesn't quite make sense here for me. I don't know what's going on, but um, as far as what I think you should do is I think you should look at all of your training and your control with your dog and the whole situation and, and look at the whole blueprint system and work out what you can do to get your dog's training and control and the relationship and control with your dog up to the highest standard possible. So whether that's just more work on the long line, more stops, more skin work, uh, more distraction on the stop, um, if the cat thing's happening, it, you, you might have some management issues there where the dog's uh, having too much freedom, maybe. You know, what's happening outside of training to keep that dog in the mindset where it's been in, where it's just way over the top while you're trying to sneak in on deer. You know, you should be able to stifle that with, with pressure. You should be able to, man. You should be able to calm all that down with pressure. And and you really should. And worst comes to worst, you should have a heel and just put the... If, if the dog's taken you in and it's been an absolute freaking idiot, just put it in behind and shoot a couple of deer over it. And do more work on the long line with it. Do work on the long line with it around rabbits. It's already chased rabbits and cats. You need to work with that dog around rabbits and cats. And increasing distraction and training. Until the dog's not been an idiot around basic distractions like that. And that, you sh that should be able to transfer over to deer. Um, but yeah, I I don't know, man. But the cat and the de and the rabbit things a huge issue. You're talking about I've shot one deer with her while out hunting. Um, but as you get close, she's amped up, frantically going backwards and forwards, side to side, almost breaks into a run. And the more pressure I put on her, the more on it she gets. Uh, something's not right, man. 
and you should be able to get it way better than that without even being around deer, just being around other stuff, and that should transfer over to the deer. Um, it really should. Kate, hi Paul, I followed the blueprint now. I followed the blueprint. Now my now my GSP lab, sorry, the, this isn't that well written. I followed the blueprint. Now my GSP lab, which is two and a half years old, I've started hunting. <laughs> this barely even makes sense. Hi, Paul. This is the, I'll read it word for word. Hi, Paul. Followed the blueprint now. 2.5 year GSP lab. Started hunting 18 months. Okay. I followed the blueprint. My GSP lab is now two and a half years old. I started hunting at 18 months. Done about 20 trips. Sorry, I should have rewritten that properly so I could read it properly. I, re I pretty much re I rewrite probably nine out of ten questions because most of them are written like that, just being honest. Uh, most of them are written like that. Hi, Paul, followed the BP now two and a half year, two and a half YR, GSP Lab X started hunting 18 months, done 20 trips. <laughs> so uh, we've got a two and a half year old GSP Lab Cross that's followed the blueprint, and it was start. It's they started hunt. Kate started hunting with the dog at 18 months old, and she's done about 20 trips. Obedience is good. She tracks well, pushes range a bit. Went on to something. Pretty much every good motivated deer dog does. But remains responsive to commands with minimal pressure, which is great. Uh, she often locks up maybe 50 or 100 metres away until told to carry on. However, once we get close, she seems to lose her nerve. As soon as she can see the animal, she stands for a few seconds and then walks back towards me and then circles back to it. If the animal is spooked, she also comes back to me submissive. I've tried putting her on a stop every time she stops to hold her there longer, but she rarely stays there. Her stops are solid in every other circumstance. I've also tried saying nothing at all but praising stops and command disapproval if it runs. Any tips on shaping a rock-solid indication? Is it just more experience? I, mean, I should have reread these questions before I did this Q&A. Um... I don't see the problem here. The dog's lo often locking up 50 or 100 metres away. That's awesome. I couldn't tell you the amount of people that would wish their dog would do that. That's also quite common and kind of what you want because particularly if it's a quiet day, um, you know, there's no wind or rain in the trees in the bush. A, a deer would definitely hear from 50 metres away unless you're going freaking quiet. Um, and as, depending how noisy you are and if, how crunchy the bush is and what's going on, a deer could easily hear from 100 metres away too. Easy. Easy. So, you re, you know, and, and a, a, definitely at 50 metres, a dog should be locking up, stopping and locking up. So that's good. Um, and then you're saying, however, once we get close, 50 or 100 metres is close. 50 metres is definitely close. However, once we get close, she seems to lose her nerve. As soon as she can see the animal, she stands for a few seconds. This is exactly what you want. And then she walks back towards me. Then circles back to it if the then circles back to it. If the animal was spooked, she also comes back to me submissive. I've tried putting her on a stop every time she stops to hold her there. Every every time I try putting her on a stop every time she stops to hold her there longer, but she rarely stays there. I've also tried saying nothing at all but praising stops and command disapproval if it runs. Command of disapproval if it runs, if the deer runs. 
you don't need to give you don't give your dog a command disapproval if the deer runs away and the dog doesn't chase it I don't sorry at this yeah this question I don't really get what's going on here or what the issue is any tips on shaking shaping a rock solid indication the dog locking up at 50 to 100 meters is pretty sounds like a pretty damn good indication to me um And I don't. To me, it almost sounds like you're you're looking into it. You're reading into it far too much and trying to do far too much. And the dog's probably picking up on that and probably doesn't know what the hell to do. It's probably it may be trying to do it, and you're reading into it. You know, once you get into fifty or hundred meters, as long as the dog's not pushing its range, you should be all about trying to shoot that freaking deer. I don't even. I, to be, I honestly don't know what's going even happening here. Um, if I've totally misinterpreted it or missed something, let me know. Um, I don't know what else to say about that really at the moment. Um, Ricky, what would you do when you have to take a pup eight weeks old to work every day? mainly watching a forestry gang release spray trees. I think spells of blueprint training mixed with crate time. My note is, yep, exactly what you said. That's what I would do. Kind of awesome if you can take your dog to work with you, um, provided you know it's not like a really crazy situation. But if you can have a crate, and if you've got a, tr a ute or a truck, you know, and the dog's in the back of the ute and a canopy or something in a crate and you can let it out for toilet breaks and do little little training walks on the long line and um, you're not exposing the pup to too much, um, sounds awesome. And and we've, we've, we've got, got and had quite a few people that have done that too, you know. Um, they've got a long work day, no one else is going to be at home, so the the option is either the pup or dog is going to be in the kennel for a bloody long day, but someone's in a position where they are lucky enough to be able to take their pup or dog to work with them and keep them crated, well crated or kenneled at work and they can get to them um, you know, every couple of few hours and take them for a walk and a toilet break and um, on the long line do it all properly, a couple of stop drills and back in the crate. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Jenny, hi Paul, just started the blueprint with my German wirehead pointer pup. It was going well with the stop drill and recall and I was all set for part two or so I thought but the pup has zoned out and is distracted, sniffing daisies and ripping up grass. He Is is he bored? Should I get this sorted before moving on? I've stuffed up somewhere. My note is this is a bit confusing. You should be able to get out into a new bigger area and get moving and move forward with training. Yeah, so GSP pup. Everything was going well, but the pup is zoned out and is distracted, sniffing daisies and ripping up grass. I don't know exactly what zoned out, sniffing daisies and ripping up grass means. Like... um. I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine with, in, in part one, um, when, in part one, we generally just keep the pup in a section, in, inside the section. Um, yeah, it was going well with the stop drill. I thought I was set for part two, so I'm guessing you're still in part one, but the pup zoned out and is distracted, sniffing daisies, ripping up grass. Um, that makes sense. If if you're in it, if you're in, you're still in the section right in part one. You haven't started um, going out to a bigger training area. Uh, the pup could get bored and just lose focus on you. There's not enough happening. You should be able to get out. Exactly what my note said. You should be able to get out into a bigger area, get moving, and move forward with training. Um. Dogs do get really bored going round and round in circles in one area. That's why I often talk about breaking things up with time and space. That's why I say time and space because uh, 
just time doesn't work because if you go, oh, I'll just walk round and round in circles in this little area before I do another stop drill, that ain't going to cut it. <laughs> the dog's going to go, nah, this still sucks. I want to be moving. I want to I want to see what's over there or around the corner. They love walking and moving. So um, you should be able to get out into a bigger space, um, get that pup sort of in explore mode, and I bet you it'll click in and start moving again and then if you let it move for a long time you know even just let it walk for five there's no, nothing wrong with that no drills for like five minutes if the pup's like still out of head sniffing and exploring five ten minutes is fine and then uh and then do your stop drill and if you if you do your stop drills well and you're making progress so you're praising the pup moving towards the release it should be good you should start to get get the ball rolling again uh, Will, I've asked this before of, about training an older dog that isn't keen to walk in front. You mentioned a pole leash, pole lead. If this is the right option, could you please explain what to do and how to use it? I've tried, but he isn't keen to go out in front. Um, so the pole lead is, uh, I've explained as you say, you mentioned a pole leash. If this is right, could you explain what to do and how to use it? I've tried, but he isn't keen to go out in front. Um, I'm pretty sure I've, I've, I've definitely described the pole lead a couple of times in Q&As, maybe even more. Um, but the pole lead is exactly that. Uh, a, a long broomstick works. A long broomstick and you tie a short, long line on the end. It might even be... By the time you put the loop around the dog's neck, there might only even be half a metre from the end of the uh, broom ha broom handle. Uh, I, I used it the last... I made built one a while ago, actually. And I used... It was called a long garden tool handle at mitre 10. So it was like a bit longer than your average broom. It was I don't know if it was for like a rake or a hoe or what. But it was like a long broom handle. So maybe... I don't know, 12, 1,200 or, or um, yeah, 1,200 or so long. Uh, even 1,200 mils, 1 1.2 metres to 2 metres long even, 1.8 metres long or so. And you have it for a dog that doesn't want to walk out in front, and then imagine just cutting the end off your long line. So it's only, you put it around the dog's neck and then the long line's around the dog's neck and there's about half a metre of long line and it's tied to the end of the broom handle. I did, the last one I made, I just drilled a hole through the broom handle, threaded the long line through it, tied a knot so it couldn't come out and now I've got a half metre long long line at the end of a two metre long broomstick. And with a dog that doesn't want to walk out in front, you can put the long line around the dog's neck because if you've just got it, it's, there's actually a um, there's a saying about this, and it's about trying to get someone to do something that they don't want to do, and often it's like trying to push someone up a hill with a piece of rope. You can't do it. You can pull someone with a rope, you can't push them because the rope just goes limp. That's what a pole lead's for. You can push someone with a pole lead. Uh, so you put the the um, with a long line, it doesn't work. If a dog doesn't want to naturally go out in front, what do you do? And you're there like, come on, where you go, let's go. And I, I uh, let me think about this. I've probably you out of God knows how many dogs I've had on a long line. If you look at my own dogs and boot camps and one on ones, um, it's a lot. Uh, I've probably used pole leads on about three dogs three or four I don't actually like using them it's a real last resort thing um, and this is probably what Will's experience the reason I don't like using them is because the do dogs don't like them if a dog doesn't like uh, doesn't want to walk in front without a pole lead they, they, they probably want to walk out in front less with the pole lead 
Uh, they just don't like it. You've got you're waving the stick around over their head and you're trying to push them ahead and all of that sort of thing. Um, but I've just had it where, and that you know what you know what pole leads are almost, and that's probably why I haven't put them. You know they weren't in the blueprint. I haven't really put them in any video series yet. Uh, pole leads. They're almost one of those expert territory things. Um, but you then, so you put the pole lead on the dog and at least you can push the dog out in front. And in the exact same way that uh, if a dog's not listening to a recall command, to a come command, you can then go, here Max, and start and pull the dog in with the lead. Now, if the dog really, really doesn't want to come, it's going to start pulling back. And you don't necessarily want to, like, have to really drag that dog in. You know, hopefully through good management, other training, building a bond and relationship with that dog, getting everything else right, that that long line is just there almost as an indicator to just indicate with the dog what to do. You know, it's just a very light uh, physical cue of, here, Max, and you give him a gentle tug. He sort of leans towards you, good boy, and then the dog comes in. That's basically how you're supposed to use a pole lead. I have got in a couple of situations with dogs before where... Um, with dogs that are really bad, or almost dogs that are a bit timid and a bit weird, where we've had a bit of a battle on the pole lead, and two or three sessions have actually been pretty full on. I've had to be really patient to not be too hard on the dog pushing it ahead with the pole lead, but it has sometimes taken uh, a lot of patience and been very niggly. Every now and again, a dog, and that's why we're in the blueprint, we take so much care with it, and it's such a focus, and that's why we do that first, get the dog walking out in front, and we worry about heel later. And We talk about all of this in the blueprint, how a dog walking in front, close in front, with its back to you, isn't necessarily a naturally comfortable position for a dog. It's actually really not. Um, and sometimes, for whatever reason, it's usually through bad handling or... Um, something like that, that a dog just decides, I do not want to freaking walk there. <laughs> and they really don't. Um, and that's when the pole lead comes in. Um, but sometimes you really do have to be um, really patient, consistent. And I have seen dogs where it's like, man, this is this is – expert territory here and I'm spending quite a bit of time for a number of sessions just to get the freaking ball rolling um, but then once I do I'm away you know so um, it's really that and it's, it's the same as, as any dog training it's it's uh, the timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise. And it's the perfect timing and measure of that, uh, of the application and releasing pressure and praise. So when you want, and, and it's linking actions with commands. So that would look like if you want a double peep whistle to be your go command, the dog's in front of you, you go and give it a push off. And if it doesn't want to go, you put in with a long line. That's how it's all set up. So you don't, it doesn't take these great forces to get things happening. Um, and push the dog off. Try to get it moving. You should be able to get it moving, you know. You really should. And um, as soon, and, and again, that's why that whole thing is, it's the application, the timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure 
and praise. Really freaking important. It's one sentence, but with so much behind it. Because, and, and you put pressure on what you don't want and you put praise on what you do want. So you go, that you want that to be your go command. So you don't want the dog to be not going after it hears that double peep. So you put pressure on that. And how in with the pole lead, you put pressure on it with the pole lead. And you're putting pressure on it in the direction in which you want the dog to travel after it hears that command. So you, you go, push the dog off. And here, there's a really important key. And this is why releasing pressure and the timing of that is very important too. The second that dog moves on its own accord, the second it transitions from you, the only reason the dog is moving is because you're pushing it with the pole lead. The second it moves faster than you're moving with the pole lead, so it's attempting to it, it's it's attempting to move on its own accord, you release all that pressure. The the pressure coming off is marking the fact that the dog is doing the right thing. And as soon as it stops, a little bit of pressure comes back on again. And as soon as it tries to move again on its own accord, the pressure comes off. And you say, good dog, and keep walking. If it tries to stop, push it off again. Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. And it's the reading and timing and the application <laughs> I got mixed up on my own line it's the it's using reading and timing for the application <sighs> timing and measure I just I just completely confused myself the timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise. That's what it is. Um, that's what it is, man. That's it. That's it. That explain, Will. Uh, that's as good as I can explain it in a podcast anyway. Uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks to everyone who signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. Remember, you can find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint at biggameindicatingdogs.com. You can follow us at Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can follow me at Paul John Michaels on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next one. Uh, a lot of you will know I'm running this freaking knee injury at the moment. The plan, about three months ago, the plan was to be hunting flat out for the last three months, but I've been flat out waiting to, and I'm actually seeing the specialist in the morning to hopefully get an MRI to hopefully work out what the hell's going on with my knee. Um, I've tried hunting a couple of times. Uh, I'm really trying to stay disciplined and stay off it um last time i tried hunting it it was just a mess i tried putting a brace on and hunting on it and it was terrible um i've heard a couple of pretty good uh nightmare stories about people having a bit of a niggly knee and carrying on doing stuff on it um while they're waiting to see the specialist and they've like and they've had a torn acl and in the meantime they've completely snapped it and stupid stuff like that so i've just been biting the bullet and st- I've been riding the exercise bike trying to keep it as good as I can and I'm off to see the specialist soon. So um, it doesn't feel too bad. I don't know what's going on there. So far, everything that we've looked at about it looks like it's a um, torn meniscus and probably not that bad. But whatever's happening with it, um, it's just hunting on. It's no good. Down, up and down hills is just no good. But um, it is what it is. I'm sure it'll come right very soon and I'll be back out there. I'm hanging out to get back out there. I put so much time 
and planning into um, getting to that stage where I was going to be doing a heap of hunting and filming and I had a new camera there and all these different mounts and all the stuff and all these trips lined up and then on the first trip uh, hurt my freaking knee but hey that's what happens every now and again um, let's keep going thanks guys see you later